it produces a gravity wave which is similar to the gravity wave that the earth produces however the craft phase shifts the wave in other words it it turns the wave not really in an opposite polarity but something to that effect where it will work against the natural gravity wave of the earth and it produces lift in, in that effect is there any internal protection for the crew does the craft generate a uh, a gravitational field inside the craft itself well the craft generates its own gravitational field being inside that field essentially doesn't shield you but it, essentially you're in <laughs> and this is a, a terrible way to say it almost in a different realm because you're you're now influenced only that by that gravitational field for instance people wonder how a craft like this can make a turn at such high speed a 90 degree turn when they would imagine people slamming up against the wall or something to that effect well that, that really wouldn't happen inertia would have no effect uh, you're you're in a distortion and don't forget that gravity distorts time and space so really nothing is going to influence you while you're in there describe the gravity amplifiers for us and some of their different operating configurations there are three amplifiers the craft can operate on a single one can lift off the ground the way in which it's propelled are two different ways there's what they call omicron configuration where the craft is using one generator uh, or a delta configuration where it's us utilizing all three delta configuration would be for space travel essentially the craft will tilt up on its side as opposed to a science fiction movie where you see a flying saucer moving around the craft will tilt up on its side focus the three gravity generators to a single point and move through space that way moving around the source of gravity is a problem to a disk because it's interference essentially so what they do is they work with that interference to their benefit they'll use one gravity generator to lift the craft off the ground and as opposed to what we're used to for instance a plane once it's in the air we envision thrust or some force coming out the back of it to push it forward the crafts work completely opposite of that what they do is once they're hovering in the air they'll swing the gravity two remaining gravity generators up in front of them and create a distortion essentially a downhill and the craft rolls downhill for infinity it's always chasing a little distortion that's why they look goofy when they fly around at low speed because they're essentially and any time you run over you know the gravity field around the earth is not completely constant and stable depending on the minerals and density of the earth underneath it the gravity will vary somewhat and you will get odd movements of the craft so it's low speed mode is is kind of unstable for the most part I only witnessed one test flight up close officially uh, that I was in just inside the hangar uh, the test was going up probably you know uh, just as the Sun was going down and it was a, a low performance test I believe there were uh, some pilots or test pilots in the craft the craft must have been retrofitted to fit them because the seating arrangements were really not accommodating um, they were in radio communication with the craft which is kind of surprising to me because the gravity waves that the craft was producing should have uh, distorted the radio waves also so uh, apparently there's something there that I don't understand um, the craft lifted off the ground uh, virtually noiseless other than a small corona discharge on the bottom of the craft indicating the presence of high voltage that dissipated at about 30 feet and it stood there completely silently and moved over to the left to the right and sat back down that was the entire uh, test however that was an extremely impressive test uh, maybe to someone that really knows little about science or anything that that wouldn't be a whole lot but you have to realize this craft was about 52 feet in diameter I don't know exactly how much it weighed but it weighed a lot and uh, this was quite quite a scientific feat to lift something completely silently under control and 
you know, perform a maneuver like that. The craft itself was, uh, I assume it was metal. It was cold to the touch. That's why I say it was metal. But it was a uh, brushed aluminum, actually just an unfinished stainless steel, not shiny uh, finish to it. Had no seams. It was as if it was injection molded from one giant die. I was completely amazed. I, I can't really reflect on how it made me feel, but it, that was exciting. How would you define gravity? Could you describe in layman's terms its basic principles for us? Gravity is something difficult to explain because it's something that we essentially don't understand. It's just something that we can observe. Not much is really known about gravity. Uh, there are many theories about it, but they are just mainly theories. There's theories of gravitons, which allege that there, these are these subatomic particles that, that act like an attractive force like gravity that exchange between two pieces of matter. There is also a theory that gravity is uh, a form of wave, an electromagnetic wave. Uh, but basically, gravity is a force. It's, uh, it's, it's the attraction. It, well, it's the inherent property of matter to have gravity, a mutual attraction for each other. And that's it, it's basically all that we really know. Modern science current science right now identifies one gravity. It's one force in nature. Uh, apparently, through research it has for or information gained from one of the crafts they were researching there, uh, it, it appears that there are two different forms of gravity. One form works on an atomic scale on subatomic particles, holding pieces of matter, holding atoms themselves together. Uh, another works on a larger scale, the scale we're most familiar with, uh, holding planets in orbit, holding ourselves to the ground, things of that sort. Because it produces a gravitational field, it, I, I wouldn't say the craft is invisible during the day. However, if you're under the craft, because of the way the gravity is being used, gravity bends time and space and it, it bends light. If you are looking underneath the craft or from certain vantage points, you will actually see what's above the craft. It's, a, it's really a trick of the way light bends under the influence of gravity. For instance, we can see stars that are behind the sun, that are blocked from our view by the sun. The reason we can see them is because the sun is a tremendous gravitational field and it's bending the light around it where we can see the star. Space, time, and gravity are all essentially interrelated. They all act on one another. Gravity bends space. Gravity also distorts time. When you vary one, you essentially vary the other two. Uh, if you, as an example, if you have a massive body, say a planet or, or something that's making a lot of gravity, producing a lot of gravitational waves, if you will, um, it distorts space. It bends space to it. It also slows down time. These things aren't theories. We know them to be true. Uh, we cannot artificially create this because we can't create gravity. Uh, but this is how they're all interrelated. What are some of the inherent problems with traveling at the speed of light? There are several problems traveling at the speed of light. Uh, just a couple of them are the fact that as your speed increases, so does your mass proportionally. Uh, in other words, the more energy you put in to go faster begins to slow you down by the fact that it's converted into mass. Um, you have other problems like just traveling at such an extreme velocity, navigational problems, the fact that you might run into little tiny micrometeorites uh, at, at speeds like this, they would undoubtedly destroy your craft. There's just a, a, a whole host of problems that you're going to run into. Uh, just attempting to do something like that. Aside from the fact the amount of energy required to accelerate to the speed of light is uh, horrendous. Could you briefly describe Project Looking Glass and Project Sidekick for us? Project Sidekick was another project going on uh, with Galileo. Galileo was the project that I was involved in. Sidekick dealt with any of the weapon potential of the craft, whether or not the craft had a weapon in it or could it be used as a weapon, but it had something to do with some sort of particle beam 
configuration where the gravity generator can be used as a lens to focus focus a weapon of some sort, similar to the SDI device we were working on in the uh, the 80s, but with the potential of a focusing device using the uh, gravity generator. And Project Looking Glass? Project Looking Glass dealt with the distortion, the fact that there's a time distortion. Essentially, looking back in time, and by that I do not mean looking back years ago to see the wagon train days. They're looking for distortions that are milliseconds in time, and what what that was used for, I, I don't know. But that was uh, just observing the time, the, you know, the time distortion, time dilation phenomena, the craft in operation. What is element 115? Is it found here on Earth, or is it strictly an extraterrestrial material? 115 is strictly an extraterrestrial material. Uh, it probably occurs naturally in some other places, maybe other star systems. Uh, you know, some people not familiar with science or chemistry say, well, that's ridiculous. All the elements occur on Earth, you know. Uh, but that's not true. There are elements on the periodic chart that aren't found on Earth. I believe the Heavy Ion Research Lab in Darmstadt, Germany, uh, has reached element 112 recently. So 115 isn't, isn't that far away. And when they synthesize it, it's not like they're making a, a couple ounces of it. They're talking about one or two atoms of it. To make any usable quantity of a heavy element like that is virtually impossible. Element 115 is in the top of the reactor. And the base of the reactor apparently is a small, something similar to a cyclotron. It's a particle accelerator. Uh, a particle is accelerated to high speed and then deflected up a small tube, and it's aimed at the 115. This transmutes the 115, uh, similar to the way we, we do that in a normal particle accelerator. Uh, this causes a, a reaction, a radiation emission that we really haven't seen before. Um, it produces antimatter. This antimatter is guided down a tuned tube and reacts with a gas. When matter and antimatter react, they convert to 100% energy. This energy is converted, heat energy, is converted to electrical power in the reactor itself. This is done through a, a thermoelectric converter. And this electrical power is used to power other subsystems on the craft, though there is no wiring, you know, as we would know it. Uh, also, that's almost a byproduct of the reactor. The reactor also sets up a gravitational wave from the 115 being bombarded. This gravitational wave was present at the top of the reactor and is essentially guided in the same way microwaves are guided, through tuned tubes. And uh, this goes to their amplifying cavities and through the projectors that are in the bottom of the craft. With the gravity generators running, is there thermal radiation danger to the crew? There is no thermal radiation while the reactor is running. The thermionic generator is 100% efficient, which is in violation of the first law of thermodynamics. But in fact, it works. Element 115 is stable. And for those familiar with chemistry, we know that uh, elements with higher atomic numbers have shorter and shorter half-lives. Um, however, when you reach a certain point, they call it the island of stability. There is a place, and we've theorized this for a long time, somewhere around 114 to 116, there should be an area in there where the nucleus of the atom is geometrically stable with protons and neutrons, where it, it no longer decays. It's not radioactive. 115 is, in fact, this element. In fact, it does occur again, somewhere around element 247. Uh, of course, you know, we're nowhere near synthesizing that. We can only you know, predict things like that, but uh, that's, that's where 115 is. Did they, the aliens, give us element 115 in large quantities? Whether or not it was given to us I, I can't answer that question. However, I was told that we have 500 pounds by one of my coworkers. Uh, how it was obtained and you know where exactly it came from, I don't know. Whether it came in one of the crafts or you know it was separate cargo somewhere, you know, anyone can speculate. But I was I was told that was the the figure. 
You were able to get away with a sample of Element 115. How much did you get away with? No comment. Nighttime test flights, unofficially, while off the base. What did you see? The test flights I saw off the base, actually the, the best test flight was witnessed by my friends who I brought out there at the uh, exact moment the craft was hopping around and doing some really impressive maneuvers. I had turned around and I think was uh, looking for the video camera or, or something to that effect, but I missed some of the most uh, impressive maneuvers. But the craft was uh, similar to what was done before that I had seen close up, other than the fact that it went above the mountain range, uh, moved a, a much greater distance at a much higher rate of speed. How were you able to find out about the test flight schedules? The test flight schedules were told to me uh, specifically because I was probably going to have to be present during those times. And at that time, the test flights were taking place on Wednesday nights. And from what they said, that was because that was uh, statistically the least amount of traffic in the area. And that's uh, all that they were concerned about. Does the propulsion system release any sort of discharge or exhaust? There was a high voltage discharge on the bottom of the craft, but uh, as far as there being an exhaust, there was none. Why did they appear as glowing balls of light in the night sky? Well, that's kind of the same reason why a neon light or a fluorescent light lights up. What you're dealing with, with is a high energy source in essentially a gas atmosphere, oxygen, nitrogen. And uh, when you apply enough energy to a gas molecule, they emit photons, they emit light. And uh, I don't think it's anything, it, it's a really a byproduct of how the craft operates. When it's a, emitting that much energy, the gas surrounding the craft emits light. The same reason why lightning is visible. You have a huge electrical discharge, and the gas emits light in the form of lightning bolts. If you were going to see one of these crafts at night operating, it would appear really as a glowing ball or a, just a bright light in the sky from a distance. Uh, even close up, you know, you'd see a, a glowing halo around it. Uh, this is typically what you'd see in your normal UFO sighting, uh, if you've heard them a lot. However, keep in mind that lights in the sky are caused by much more common things than flying saucers.